Perfect. I think we can start the session. Uh, hello, welcome everyone uh, to another session of Azure Zero to Hero. We are happy that you joined our session and uh, you can scan this QR code to be able to uh, find social, all social media links, YouTube and Microsoft Learn link. Uh, today, uh, Mohsen and I uh, hosting this session and we have our special guest here, uh, Leo. So he's going to share a lot of good knowledge uh, about the networking side of the Azure. So I hope you enjoy uh, enjoy this session. So uh, about Microsoft Learn, uh, we uh, mentioned about Microsoft Learn in uh, every single sessions that we have. So basically, Microsoft Learn is a richest place that you can have access to a lot of learning contents regarding to a different uh, uh, services and knowledge regarding to services and uh, Microsoft technologies. Uh, beside that, you have this option to be connect to experts. So you can ask your question, you can share your knowledge, and also you can use uh, a lot of benefits of, of being a part of these uh, different communities that Microsoft learns handle so if you want to be connect to microsoft learns uh, you can check out the link that we have here aka.ms slash microsoft learn communities and if you have any questions please uh, contact us uh, so we can uh, answer your questions so if you are beginner or if you are uh, already an expert so you can be part of this big community we are uh, uh, about 2000 members together so it's a big community and it's a good opportunity if you want to share and learn together uh, with us. Uh, we have our code of conduct. So we expect that you be aware of the others, be friendly and patient, be welcoming and respectful. Also be open to all questions and in viewpoints, uh, understanding of differences and be kind and considerate to others. So now I hand over this session to Leo. So Leo, please start your session and we will enjoy the contents that you are going to share with us. Good luck, man. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can see the slides. Yes, yes, we so can see. So uh, it will be a bit of a challenge because there will be a lot of live demos. So. I need to change my screen a bit, but we'll see how it goes. Um, thank you for having me and everybody um, in the chat and in the live stream, welcome. And everybody who looks at this later, still welcome. I hope you'll enjoy this. So the talk I want to give today is it's always DNS. And we're going to talk a bit about the cloud native DNS resolver. Before we do this, a little bit about myself. I'm a cloud consultant at OGD ICT Dienste in the Netherlands. Um, very recently, I became a MVP for Azure Networking and Security. I'm also a core infrastructure expert and a consultant for hybrid environments. And if you want to know more about me, you can find my blog and my socials where I post stuff about networking, DevOps, and whatever I like to write about. So today I want to go with you through the Azure networking and we're going to start a little bit about what DNS actually is, how DNS works in Azure, how it works in a hybrid environment. Then we're going to look a little bit about to what a split horizon DNS is and in the end we're going to see how this private DNS resolver fixes a lot of the problems we have. When I created this talk, I noticed that a lot of colleagues and people I work with found DNS quite scary, especially also when um, doing lessons like uh, the AZ700 or the AZ800 exams when teaching these um, lessons. I noticed a lot of people found the DNS part quite scary because often when we discover problems in our environments, it's 
kind of the reason it's kind of the fault of dns and for a lot of people it's a bit of a black magic box so with this talk i hope to demystify how dns works and how the dns in azure works because the more stuff we add to it the more complex it becomes so what is dns very easily said dns is kind of the phone book of the internet in the inter on the internet if i want to go to any resource i need an ip address like you see the ip address below i like to introduce some puns so sorry for the punny ip address um, i can tell you it's not the ip address of my website i would love it to be though so if anybody knows who has this ip address and if it's for sale i'm uh, i'm all ears um, but what it does is we take a URL, like for example, the website you see on screen, and a DNS server will translate this URL into a IP address. And this IP address I can use to actually find the resource I'm looking for. Because the internet, to navigate it, I need these IP addresses. The URLs are nice. They're nice for us to remember as humans. But I need the DNS protocol, the domain name system protocol to actually find these things. A lot of the times when we're using DNS, we're not instantly going to the source. There's many different steps involved in how the DNS is resolved online. Today, I'm not really going to look into this. During a lot of talks and um, lessons, you will learn a bit more how the recursion works when you actually go online with root DNS servers and so on. Today, I want to more focus more on, say I'm in an environment at home, for example, and I have my router. A lot of times this router will be my DNS server, but it doesn't have a phone book of the whole internet. So this router will send it to something else. The same happens when I'm in a company. If I'm in a company environment, we will have DNS servers and these DNS servers, they will get the stuff online. They will request this for me online and give it back. And they will also cache it. So not everything has to be looked up any, every time because probably in a company, a lot of people will go to, for example, Google. So if it checked for Google once, it will probably for a while be able to use this same IP address. Although lately this is becoming more and more of a um, different case due to all the load balancing and stuff happening, but still we can use a lot of caching. And I've explained this many, many times. And a while ago, I was like, I've explained this a lot of times, but I've actually never seen it happen. Um, so the first thing I want to do with you now is just look at how this, what we call recursion uh, happens and what's happening uh, in the background. So I'm gonna now share my screen with you and Let's hope this works. Yes. So. Um, I've got a virtual machine in Azure and I've got a. DNS server in Azure. And I've got these open. So here I'm on a virtual machine. And I can, for example, do IP config all. And we'll see that it has a DNS server set to a specific IP address 10.10.0.4. I can also go to a server here. I can also start PowerShell over here. If it wants to start, one time is enough. Um, PowerShell. 
And this one should be the 10.10.0.4. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to query a specific name. I'm going to query server01.demo2.autosysops.com and I'm going to query www.microsoft.com. And I'm going to check what's going to happen. To check what's happening, I'm going to use the tool which is called Wireshark. With Wireshark, I can capture what's happening on the line, on my network. And I'm going to add a filter called DNS, so I only see the DNS traffic. I'm going to do the same on the server. So we should see, if I go back to the client, and I'm going to run the first command. I want to be on the client. Sorry, I got the taskbar. Not showing me the right taskbar, so. Me my proper taskbar. Let's do it like this for a second then. Don't we all love RDP? So I'm going to query this. And I'm going to query this. Now it's really annoying. I can't see this taskbar. Now I can. And some stuff happened in between. So let's just clear it one more time because I was doing some other stuff. So we can really see what's happening. run these two one more time. Oh. And let's stop the capture. Here and let's stop the capture here and then we're going to look what happened. So. This we can um, ignore. It's the telemetry of Microsoft doing stuff. So we're seeing a query going to server01.demo2.autosysops.com and we see a response and we see a query and we see a response. We see it has a source address and a destination address. So we're sending it to the 10.10.0.4 and we're getting it back from the 10.10.0.4 and it's sending it to the 10.10.05, which is this machine. So this is what's happening with DNS. We're sending a query and we're getting a response back. And inside the response, it shows us the IP address. So it shows us what the IP address is of the machine we're looking for. On the server, zoom in a little bit more. We have the telemetry, which we can ignore. So we see the server 01 happening and we see the instant response. But also we see the query from Microsoft and there's something else happening. There's something in between happening here. And then it's sending response back. And there's something else in between, it's the recursion which is happening. So let's go back to our slides. And here we can see it a little bit better. 
because the last capture, because there was something happening in between, it was a bit uh, not so easy to see. But here we can see on the server that we got the query from Microsoft on the server, and then the server sent it somewhere else to actually ask what Microsoft is, got a response back, and sent the response back to our machine. So this is what happen what's happening with this server. It's requesting it somewhere else. So that's the first thing about the DNS. But now, um, when I'm in Azure, there is something called the Azure DNS. If you're looking at documentation and other stuff, a lot of the times they're talking about Azure DNS and they're talking about this IP address 168.63.129.16. It's a very important IP address when you're working with Azure. If you see this IP address, you know you're talking with the Azure DNS. And although it is a public DNS or a public IP address, it's not in one of the private ranges, it is kind of private inside your Azure virtual networks. You can have a mach machine go to this IP address and resolve stuff inside your Azure environment. So let's go back to sharing the screen. Second, let me close this one so it doesn't pop up. So when I'm in Azure and I link machines to a virtual network, they are added to the Azure DNS. So the Azure DNS will know, for example, this ACL Win01 and it will know this ASV DNS01. Azure DNS knows these machines, but um, it's, it's not always accessible easily, and we'll go, we get into this. But I have a machine over here. At least I believe I have a machine over here, which also doesn't want to show its taskbar properly, so let's also add a scroll bar. And on this machine, if I do a IP config all, the DNS server you see is set to this IP address we just noted. Um, when I create a virtual machine in Azure, on default, this IP address will be used for the DNS server. On the previous machine, I configured it to use the DNS server I created in Azure. But on this machine, it created a, an IP address or it created this DNS server by itself. So if I'm going to now run Wireshark on this machine, let's zoom out a little bit and filter on DNS. And I'm going to call this command. Oh, let me open PowerShell. It will show me a response. And here, we see that it sent it to this IP address, the query, and I've got back the answer. So this Azure DNS clearly knows at least some things because what we were querying was the server 01.demo2.autosysops.com. So it does know it and it can return it. And I could also, for example, ask it to um, show me Google or anything else, and it will return it. So here we also see the screenshot. And then we're getting to the harder part, because 
if I'm building an environment in Azure and I'm building just some virtual machines which are standalone, this Azure DNS is nice. But when I'm building with, let's say, more legacy technology like ADDS, Active Directory Services, a lot of the times I need my machines to be able to find the Active Directory domain controllers. And these domain controllers will also be DNS servers. So this is when we're getting to this first situation I have. If I want to join a machine, a virtual machine in Azure to a Active Directory domain, it needs to be able to resolve this domain. So a solution we often use is just setting the DNS server of these virtual machines to the domain controller. Luckily, there is an option to use something which is called a forwarder. And a forwarder will forward DNS queries it doesn't know to whatever I specify as a forwarder. If you're using the DNR, the Azure edition of Windows Server, it will actually have this forwarder auto configured for you. And then there's also something else in Azure. It's called a private DNS zone. Because sometimes I have resources which need to be resolved. For example, a storage account. A storage account is more like a platform as a service. Uh, option in Azure. It's not a server. It's not something which is normally connected to my network. It just has like an endpoint. But I might want to make connect this to my network with a private endpoint. When I'm creating a private endpoint, a private DNS zone will be included. I'm not going to go into the private endpoints too much at the moment. Just know that there's an option where I can connect this storage account to my network. And when I do, a private DNS zone is configured on this network so it can find this IP address for my storage account. And this private DNS zone is known by the Azure DNS. Let's look at how this works in Azure itself. So in Azure, I have a storage account. And this storage account has a private endpoint connection to my network. You can check this private endpoint connection. And when we go to the virtual network, to the subnet, uh, sorry, not to the subnet, to the connected devices, we will see that the storage account, the FS file 01, has its IP address inside this subnet. And a private DNS zone was created, which is called private link. All private DNS zones will normally start with private link. Dot file dot core dot windows dot net. And in there we have the storage account. Because normally if I want to connect to the storage account, I would go to the name of the storage account dot file dot core dot windows dot net. And it will give me the public location. And when I connect my private DNS zone to the Azure DNS, it will see that there's this private link version of it and give this one precedent over the public one. How it exactly does this is a bit of black magic, but know that although it says here private link, I can still go to the normal URL, the normal URL, and it will replace it with the private link version. So let's check out this machine. And here we have this name again. And I'm going to see if I can resolve this and what's happening. So let's start a new capture.
So it gave me back this IP address, the 101006, which is correct, which we saw in the thing. And we see that it sent it to the DNS server and the DNS server sent it on. I think I accidentally also had to capture. Oh no, we didn't have to. And how did this happen? Well, on this DNS server, I can go to the properties of my DNS server and here I have my forwarder. So if we look in the forward lookup zones, there's only two forward lookup zones and none of them were what we were querying. So this DNS server was like, I don't know it. And when it doesn't know it, it will use this forwarder. And because I'm using the Azure edition of Windows Server 2021, 20, 2022, not exactly sure which one I'm using. Um, this IP address was automatically set for me already. So, let's continue. Because so far so good, but now we're going to introduce a hybrid environment. And this is where stuff very quickly starts to break down. Because once I'm introducing a hybrid environment and I have a on-premise environment, for example, connected with an express route to my Azure environment, I need to be able to resolve these DNS queries, for example, this private DNS zone, also on-premise. If I want to connect to the storage account on-premise over my express route to secure the traffic, I need to be able to resolve this, but this IP address is a public IP address. So either in my configuration on premises for my routing, I would need to set up a specific route for this specific IP address, or I need to do some other weird things. It's, it's not nice. Due to it being a public IP address, it's getting hard to um, change it because if I have this DNS server on premise and I set this forwarder, it it needs to go there. So the solution we often use is on premises. I create a conditional forwarder to my DNS server in the cloud, which has a forwarder to the Azure DNS which then can find the private DNS zone. This is what I see at a lot of companies and it works, but it requires quite some maintenance and it makes my DNS infrastructure quite complicated because if a user on premises is querying the storage, the storage account, for example, it goes through multiple different steps which can all go wrong and will all go wrong because we're talking about DNS. And then things become even more interesting because there is this th thing called a split horizon DNS. Many companies have a domain, a, a Active Directory domain or whatever, and they use for example, their website. In this case, for example, I can use a domain called autosysops.com, a publicly routable domain. Or maybe I just want to host some web apps in my environment and I want to allow users when they're in my corporate network to use an internal route to this web app and people from the outside, I want to be able to use a public route to go there. So I will have the same URL, for example, this web app or the website or whatever, 
But depending on where you are, the route will change and the IP address you need to uh, reach it changes. This is what we call a split horizon DNS. Because in this case, what's happening is that in my network, I will have a DNS server which has the private route, the internal route, and somewhere in the cloud, somewhere online, I will have a DNS server which will has which will have the public one. And depending on my connection, I will get either the public or the private one. But what this often means is that some um, sysadmin or whatever needs to make sure that these two DNS infrastructures at least have the same queries. And when something migrates, they are both changed. So a lot of copy pasting is happening. I've seen it so many times that we migrate a web application or whatever, the public DNS records are changed, everything works during the weekend or whatever. On Monday, people arrive at the office and service desk gets swamped with calls because they can't reach the web app anymore because somebody forgot to also update it in the on-premise environment. As it also has a new IP address. Or maybe it should now go to the public version instead. There's no private version anymore and it's still referring to the private version which doesn't exist anymore. This is a problem we often see. There's reasons, there's solutions to it. We can use automation tools like PowerShell to deploy the DNS records to the servers. We can make sure we use infrastructure as code to make sure all our machines are referring to these DNS servers and they're deployed. It kind of works, but in many companies which are a bit bigger, we don't have one team which manages the Azure, the DNS, the machines, and so on, and so on. And I found it quite often that the team which was managing the Active Directory domain was a different team which was, for example, managing the cloud platform, the deployment of applications, and whatever. And this team which deployed the applications they needed to change these DNS records. So they needed a way to then deploy these DNS records to the DNS servers, which were often also used for the domain things. Because often these web apps were also named in the domain, in the forwarding zone for this domain. So either they had to make requests to these people managing the domain to change it every time, and when you're setting up a deployment which works via CICD and has a rapid deployment cycle, this becomes a problem. So, the private DNS resolver to the rescue. At least we hope. With this private DNS resolver, I can kind of. Um, offload some of the problems I have. I can create a resource in Azure where I can send queries to, which can connect to the Azure DNS and which is also uh, reachable from the Azure DNS. So let's look a little bit at how this one works in Azure. And let's see if we can do a little demo with it. So, here I have my private DNS resolver. And when you first look at the documentation of the private DNS resolver, it sounds very scary. It, it, 
first time I read the documentation when it was still in private preview. It's still a quite new feature. It's now publicly available, general available. I was playing with it when it was still in private preview. It all felt kind of weird because I had to create a inbound endpoint, which I had to connect to a subnet and a outbound endpoint, which I had to create to a subnet. And these subnets had to be completely empty of anything else. So I was like, what's happening here? Why do us, does it need complete subnets and whatever? When working more with it, I figured out that this is to create different connections, to be able to connect from multiple points to this resolver. So it's possible that this resolver, because it has a outbound endpoint, which is a whole subnet, it might return our request from different IP addresses, some IP address from the subnet. I am going to see if we can make this happen in the demo, but I can't assure it because it kind of depends on how fast it's responding to the queries and so on. I believe for this demo, I have to go to this machine again. We're at demo four now. So I'm going to try to resolve this specific name. And as we remember, this machine. Um, was connected to the DNS server, which is the Azure DNS. Oh, sorry, wrong minimalize. But this name is not a name which should be known in Azure, because if I go to the DNS server, I believe it's in this one. This is a this is a IP address, but it's not the IP address. It's it should be able to figure out. And the second one, we're going to query to actually to the uh, private DNS resolver because this should be the IP address for the private DNS resolver. If we go to the inbound subnet, we will see that it's in this inbound subnet and it's in this range. It now shows here the IP address dot four, but actually it's any IP address in this range. At least I hope it works. So I'm going to start a Wireshark on this server. And I'm going to start a Wireshark on this client. I'm going to copy this. We see we got both times an answer. Let's stop the captures. And let's see what happened. So we sent a query and we got back a response. We send it to the Azure DNS and we got back a response from the Azure DNS. And we send it to the private DNS resolver and we got a response back from the private DNS resolver. On our server, this is telemetry thingies. We got a response, uh, we got a request from our client. Um, no, we got a request instantly from the a private DNS resolver because both go through the private DNS resolver now. As we saw in the sheets, the private DNS resolver can talk to the um, Azure DNS. So we send it to the Azure DNS and the Azure DNS send it to a private DNS resolver, and it does this by its rules. So, if we check the forwarding rules, 
this is the core of our um, uh, private DNS resolver. This is what our private DNS, DNS resolver makes tick. Here I can specif specify rules. I can give them a name and I can give them a domain name. And the more specified this domain name is, the more precedent it will have. So for example, here we see demo.autosysops.com and we see site.demo.autosysops.com. If I send server.demo.autosysops.com, it will use this destination IP, but with site, it uses this one, that the more specific it is, this is more specific than this, the more uh, the one it, that's the one it will use. They don't have to be in a specific order. It will just always take the most specific one. So we were querying aclwin01.demo.autosysops.com demo.autosysops.com, which sends it to this machine. This is why it, we received it. And we see actually that one of the requests, one of the queries, it came from 2.6, one was from 2.5. This is because this DNS resolver has its outbound endpoints in the DNS subnet, which is two dot something. So both went to the DNS resolver, both went to our server, but it was two different IP addresses. And this is why we need to connect this subnet to it. So here we see it again in case, for example, something goes wrong. We check the rules, we check the things. So also something we want to note is um, this rule set, these rules, you do link them to a specific virtual network. So to actually make it work, I do need to link it to a virtual network. This goes the same for the private DNS zones. A private DNS zone also needs to be linked. Once you link it, the Azure DNS in this virtual network will be able to connect to connect it. So you can create a lot of these rule sets and they won't influence your whole network instantly. Only when you link them to specific virtual networks will they actually work. Checked out the subnets, then we did this. And here we also saw that it came from two different IP addresses. And here in this example, you see, for example, it used, used 2.8 and 2.5. Hey, so we're going instantly to the next demo. Now, to share the screen again. Now I'm going to resolve just the word site. And if I do a ipconfig all, there is a DNS suffix, suffix uh, the primary DNS suffix, which will always be appended to what I'm looking for. If I don't specify anything, so effectively, we're looking for site.demo2.autosysops.com. In the Azure environment, I have a public DNS zone called demo2.autosysops.com. This one has a thing called site, which contains Hello world. 
I believe I also here have a demo 2autosysops.com but it doesn't contain site. So if I would query my local DNS server, it wouldn't be able to find it. It will would only be able to find it in the public one. But it would still say, hey, I'm authoritative for this zone. So if I would only query this specific DNS server, it would just return it doesn't exist. But because this machine goes to the Azure DNS, it will go to our private DNS resolver, which has the forwarding rule set, which we just looked at. And these rules have a site.demo2.autosysops.com, which sends it to 8.8.8.8, which is the public DNS servers hosted by Google. So what I'm saying in this rule is I'm going to. Um, if you're if somebody is looking for this specific one. Just send it to the Internet, just send it to a Internet DNS server and I picked Google here. You can also use 1.1.1.1, for example, for Cloudflare one or any other publicly available DNS server. This one will then use the Internet DNS structure to find my public DNS zone in Azure. Which will return. The result for site. So if we're going to try this, we're going to try it on here. I'm going to copy this. We're going to. Start a new capture. Uh, sorry, I need to open PowerShell. Let's clear it, call it. And you see, we got the answer, hello world, back. And also in here, we send it to the Azure DNS and the Azure DNS responded. And the Azure DNS made sure it was effectively sent to our public DNS zone for demo two, which returned us hello world. So this already makes it quite nice. Um, this is in case the things don't work. And then I became a little bit cheeky because with a tool like this, it's nice to also see what's the limits. What are the limits we can push it to? What things are possible? So until now we had like demos which are um, normal. At least I think we're there now. Yeah, yeah we're there. Uh, which uh, which you would see in practice. This this demo we're going to see now might be less practical, but a lot of fun to just look at how it's working. So from this machine, I am going, and you might already see it on here. It might fail but hopefully it will work. I'm going to query client01.demo.autosysops.com and I'm going to specifically send it to the forwarder. I, sh I don't have to specify this, but it's nice to specify it so we can see it in the captures. So demo1 is hosted on this server. Um, which now also made me lose my taskbar. Here we've got demo. Um, I said demo one, but it doesn't say demo one. It just says demo, sorry. So here we have client one. Client one is a alias, a C name. 
it's a C name for ACL Win01, which we also have over here. But we also have our forwarding rule set. And in our rule set, something special is happening because in our rule set, we specified that client 01 should be sent to the public DNS. So let's see what's happening in the public DNS. Let's keep this one open so we can compare it easily. Here we also have a client one, which also has the C name. So it has the same record. I copy the record to both sides. But you see here, I provided a C name record, which is not in the public DNS. But still, if we're going to do this, you will see it works. And afterwards, I'm going to explain how it works. Maybe some see it already, but we can try. So I'm going to start a capture on this server. I'm going to start a capture on this client. I'm going to copy this and then pray to the demo gods it's all working. At least we got an answer back. Let's quickly stop the capture so we don't get anything weird in there. And now let's see what happened. So we sent the query twice. This was due to some weird things, but Ignore that we send it twice and we got a response back. We got a response back which says there is an IP address. So we got the IP address 101005 back. Now, on the server, we have something we can ignore. And on the server, we see we only got a question for ACL Win01. We were asking for Client01 and there's no question for Client01 at all at this server. Only for the ACL Win01. What happened was we were sending it to the Azure DNS, to the private DNS resolver. It saw Client01 it sent it to the Google DNS, to the internet, which then found it on my public DNS zone, which gave back the ACL01, which returned on the forwarder, which then saw that ACL01 is something in the demo domain, so then it sent it to the demo domain, to the 101004, the server, which received it, sent the, sent the response back to the resolver, which then saw I've got an IP, back, IP address back and sent it back to my client to give a response. Um, this one. So there was a lot of steps happening at once. But you see that with this resolver, we actually have a lot of possibilities. I could make a whole weird chain. I don't want to. I want to simplify it as much as possible. But you see, it's possible. This is in case it doesn't work, which often it doesn't. But this time it did. So. Closing off, with this private DNS resolver, I have some very interesting advantages because this private DNS resolver can be deployed by infrastructure as code, including these rules. So what it means is I don't have to 
go to a domain domain controller or whatever and create the rules in there to make sure the forwarders are set up correctly and so on. I can just make sure that all my machines in Azure use the Azure DNS. I don't have to set up any weird custom DNS settings, even if I want to domain join them, because I can just use this resolver to make sure that if they want to go to this domain, they are sent to this domain controller. And if not, then not. It also has a IP address, which I can define. So on my on-premise environment, I can just specify this IP address if I want to and have things sent there or use a forwarder on-premise if I want to have less data traffic going to, uh, between my on-premise environment and my cloud environment. So I can create some split management. And this makes it that I can better split out different delegations and make sure that in this way people can manage my DNS environment better. Of course, it wouldn't be Microsoft if there wouldn't be pricing. I think these prices might be a little bit outdated now. Um, not sure. The prices change all the time, but there still should be at least around this uh, amount, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower. It also depends on the region you're in. These were the prices for West Europe, I believe. And you see that a private DNS resolver itself is um, not that much, but you need the inbound and outbound endpoints. Technically, I believe you can make it work with only inbound or outbound endpoints, but you do need to look up the limitations if you want to go this route and maybe save some money on there. Um, most cases, I think you would need the inbound and outbound endpoints. And you would need to pay something for the rule set. These amounts look quite hefty, it's like. Um, at least like almost. Uh, 320, 330 a month just for the endpoints. But don't forget that often if you're setting up DNS servers in the cloud to handle this, you want to set them up at least redundant. You want to set them up on bit better virtual machines. So it's quite easy that you have a virtual machine which is already like 150 a month. You have two of them, you have some more. You're getting in the same ballpark for the pricing. And this gives a lot of options. There are some limitations. One rule set can only have two of uh, 1000 rules. So if you're getting with very big complex environments, you might need more rule sets. But you don't need an endpoint for different virtual networks. So you can have one endpoint serve multiple different virtual networks. And like I said before, the cost is about equivalent to small sized virtual machines. And with this, um, I hope you enjoyed this and that you learned something from it. And yeah, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Lil so much uh, good information and data you shared with us and i need to mention if people in the meeting have a plan to go with uh, exam 700 or even uh, 800 uh, make sure you rewatch this video because there are a lot of questions that you can find in the exam that just Leo yes. mentioned about them. So it, it was really good. I, I like the way that you showed us, you know, switching between presentation and demo. And it's like, okay, this is the information, this is the theory, and this is the <laughs> actual plan that you can have with uh, your environment. That was perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, if there is any questions,
please uh, send to the chat or use raise hand option so we can open your mic. You can ask your questions directly uh, from below. Uh, regarding the question that they ask regarding to the, the recording. Yes, uh, we upload the recorded session to our YouTube channel and we will share the link in our social media and Microsoft Learn channel. So yeah, uh, you will have the recording session. I can also uh, tell that there's also a written version of this talk on my blog and uh, cool. more stuff about this will come very soon also. Amazing, amazing. Looking forward to read that. <laughs> it will be in, I believe, the as you're back to school, I will send uh, write a new chapter of this. Yeah, sure. Uh, they ask about, uh, yeah, they've seen it. The ask about the black, uh, blog address. So yeah, it's inside the presentation. <laughs> I believe it's on screen now. Yeah, 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 yeah. They can yeah, see yes. it. They, they found it. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, is there any questions? You, Monsen, have any question? No, that's great. And other people have a question. Uh, they can raise hand. I think uh, uh, we have a uh, one question. We have two uh, questions actually. Yes. So so they can ask, we can use we a coding use GitHub code? link? Yeah. Ah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, okay. Can we use a code in GitHub link to make some test and video to post on LinkedIn or for example? I think this is a question for you regarding the demo things. Yeah. Um, I don't know from the top of my head how much codes on there is on GitHub about this specific one. Um, but always feel free everything on my github is mit licensed so you can always use it without any problems but also without any help which kind Amazing. of means mit um i believe the sheets are also somewhere on my github so you can actually the this slide deck i used or a version of it should be on the github somewhere if you look for it so feel free to use it if you want sure and there is another question, uh, which is actually a good question. How did uh, we use Wireshark with Azure? Yeah, um, there are many different ways to use Wireshark with Azure. Um, what I did, I just uh, had the virtual machines in Azure and just installed Wireshark in these virtual machines and run it just like you would on any machine. There is also the possibility to use um, the built in kind of uh, uh, capture in Azure Monitor, where you can use a, a network interface card, a NIC, and capture data from here and get it in a format which you can open, for example, in Wireshark. But like I said, I just installed Wireshark on these machines and run it on there, and that works. I wouldn't recommend this doing in a production environment, though. Many security officers won't like it if you install Wireshark on a production machine. Yeah, <laughs> like having a sniffer machine <laughs> in their environment. <laughs> OK, there, is, there are two more questions. Uh, can the you please provide a bit? Yeah. yeah, can you please provide a bit of knowledge about any software you are using? Um, can you, for the person who asked this question, can you specify, I'm using a lot of software for many different things. So can you specify more? Do you mean, for example, in like a network inf uh, inventory or network uh, investigation or wh what kind of software are you looking for? Maybe it, they will answer in the chat. Yeah. Also, there is a question uh, from Ahmed. We offer internal and internship demos. Can we use your material without any uh, infringements? Infringements. I yeah, infringement. Yeah. Um, um, I believe the slide deck is on my GitHub on M MIT license, which means you are allowed to use it in whatever capability you want, uh, commercial or whatever. Just also know you will have no support from me. So, of course, yeah. If you have any questions, always feel free to ask on LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, we need to call it nowadays, or whatever. But can't make any promises on this. But feel free to use it. I won't um, 
um, complain about it. If you want to do a talk on a conference and you're submitting exactly this talk, I wouldn't be happy about it, but yeah. I can't yeah, stop it's, you. it's always good to mention about, you know, yeah. to author. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any more questions, but yeah, I think we can wrap up this session. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much again, Leo, uh, regarding this meeting and all of knowledge and experience that you shared with us. And yeah, hope to see you uh, in the other session next week, Saturday. So take care. Have a great evening, night, morning. And yeah, wish you a great week and weekend. Thank you very much. Lee. Thank you, Say. Thank you, guys. Can we also have a big applause from the chat for these guys organizing this? Uh, sorry again, what did you say? Can we have a big applause from everybody still here to for these guys who organized this? Oh, okay. this organized <laughs> this awesome oh, community. <laughs> I saw some applause already. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Okay, cool. Take care, everyone. See you soon. Bye bye.